Thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DoD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DoD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD cybersecurity and information systems research. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC. Before we will begin, uh, I would like to note a couple of administrative items. Uh, first, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSIAC webinar announcement. You can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. Uh, when you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say download presentation. Uh, second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat window on the lower right hand side of the screen. Uh, you can use that to chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. Uh, however, if you'd like to pose a question for the Q and a session, uh, please click the 3 dots labeled more slash panel options to bring the Q and a window uh, up as part of your layout for WebEx. At the end of the presentation, I will go over the Q and a for the benefit of those on the phone. I'll read those questions out loud to the presenter. If you have any technical issues during the presentation, please have no fear. Uh, the full presentation will be available online. Please check back to the CSI website. Once the webinar is posted, uh, the go to webinar button will take you to the YouTube link with today's recording. Uh, with that said, I'd like to introduce today's uh, presenter. Uh, we have Dr. Cecil DeBello from uh, the U.S. Army CCDC Army Research Laboratory. Uh, he is a computer scientist there in the Military Information Sciences Intelligent Perception Branch. He serves as the technical lead for the synthetic data for artificial intelligence machine learning research, where he develops solutions for synthesizing Army relevant data, closing the synthetic to real gap, and integrating synthesis and ML pipelines for multiple Army domains. This includes target and action recognition from unmanned ground aerial vehicles and satellite imagery. His recent research has focused on generative AI and multimodal large pre-trained models. Other interests include human machine teaming and the ethics of AI. His cross-disciplinary work has been published in a variety of journals and peer-reviewed conferences. Dr. DeMello holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Southern California and MS and BS from the IST Technical University of Lisbon, Portugal. He also completed a postdoc at the University of Southern California Marshall School of Business. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, really, really excited to to hear the feedback that that may come from this crowd. I'm always looking for feedback. Um, today, I'll be talking about generative AI. Uh, we call it large pre-trained models. It's it's more of a technical term. So hopefully, you can see the slides. Um, and, and this is sort of a, a curated summary of a big meeting we had back in November 2023. Um, we brought together a lot of um, scientists, DOD uh, experts, um, and, and industry folks to discuss the opportunities, challenges uh, um, related to, to this, this, this new technology, Genevieve AI, large per trade models. 
Okay, so so what are large retail models? Uh, basically, they're, they're deep neural networks trained on large quantities of unlabeled data. Um, so this is the idea of scale plus self-supervision. Um, self-supervision in the sense that we're not adding new labels. Uh, of course, we, we're leveraging the labels that already exist on the web or whatever. Um, and then adapting the same latest space to a multitude of downstream tasks. So this third idea of transfer learning. Um, now, when we do this at scale, what we're seeing is these amazing, interesting, um, but also dangerous uh, emergent capabilities, uh, which, which should be relevant to a multitude of UV use cases. And in this slide, the first thing I would note is our focus from the start is not just language applications. Uh, this, this is maybe what you may see more out there, um, summarization, Q&A, and so forth. But really, the same latent space can also be used or leveraged for all sorts of other uh, applications. And if the, if the latent space is based on multimodal data, then uh, so much so. You know, so you, you feel free to think about robotics, visual applications, and many other kinds of uh, use cases. Now, to be clear, uh, this, this is a new um, paradigm. So perhaps what we've been doing up to this point is more like specialized models for specific use cases. So we take lots of real data or lots of synthetic data, uh, and we go ahead and train specialized models for each use case. But now, our starting point are, are these large pre models. Um, and these models may be coming from all sorts of different stakeholders, from industry, hopefully more DOD, uh, academia. And then the challenge is to distill the relevant knowledge from each of these models, compose them, adapt them uh, together um, to serve uh, a specific set of use, uh, DOD use cases or a single DOD use cases. And maybe we have to fine tune it with much less uh, uh, DOD specific data. Um, and then we go ahead and apply uh, uh, this, this model to, to different kinds of, of tasks. So lots of new research challenges, uh, but also lots of new possibilities. Okay, so like I said, this is a, a summary, a curated summary of, of a big meeting we had uh, with broad engagement from DOD, academia, and, um, and industry. The report for that um, meeting is coming out um, early fall. And as we go through this discussion, I also want us to think about the ecosystem um, here. Uh, this is a, a unique ecosystem in many ways. Um, I like the analogy to, to space exploration at some point. The government realized that we, we really don't need to be building uh, all the uh, rocket ships uh, um, ourselves, we can just go ahead and leverage what industry does be best and focus on, on other critical problems. So here, probably we need to start thinking in those terms as well. In fact, I would argue it's critical to start thinking in those terms, uh, given uh, the, 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 the challenge that it is to train these, these big models. It requires a lot of compute, uh, it's, it's expensive and so forth. So really what we should be doing is, is understanding clearly what is our role, the DoD role in this space, uh, optimize for that, and work with our partners uh, to, to, to build this ecosystem. An underlying uh, discussion, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on this later, uh, is what is the compute infrastructure we need, we at the DoD need to, to uh, support this ecosystem. Okay, um, so we, this is a, a, a summary of some of the challenges uh, and risks associated with this technology. Um, I'll go over some of them. Uh, there's a lot of information here, so feel free to um, raise the questions on, uh, in the Q&A or, or just uh, reach out after. Uh, there's, there's, there's some references there too, so um, you know, feel free to, to dive deeper on whatever may be more interesting to you. So the first thing uh, on the left side are sort of the new opportunities, you know, multimodal models, the, um, um, the reasoning capabilities, scientific experimentation, and then on the right side, it's more along the lines of risk mitigation, okay? How do we uh, make sure we can use these uh, while mitigating some of the risks like hallucination or making sure we, we understand where the, uh, uh, what, what are the, um, what is the support for, for the output that is coming out of these models? So let's start with multimodality. Um, so um, if we look at nature, say, say human children, uh, clearly children are learning in a multimodal way about the world. They interact with it and leverage all of their sensory input um, to build these rich underlying representations of the world, even before they utter the, the first word. Um, and, and, these, in, in, and these models are, um, these internal models, world models, are very useful for a multitude of tasks um, as they grow. So this is the idea we want to bring to AI as well. Um, building these multimodal models is likely to allow us to do much more than if we think only of models built on language tokens. And in the case of AI, we're not limited to the, to the natural sensors. In, in fact, anything that we can measure, measure with a machine is, is fair game. So you can think 
of IR, geospatial, whatever, whatever uh, modality, there's a chance we may be able to build a model um, for it. Now, the idea is that these uh, multimodal models are, are, are like world models uh, that enable open world perception, reasoning, and action, um, which introduces a whole new set of uh, use cases. Um, and we are starting to see the first uh, generation of, uh, of models coming out of the industry. So, th so th think of GPT-4.0 or, or Gemini, um, and, and, and they already are able to do uh, a few interesting things uh, uh, that go beyond language. But I would note that these are still unlikely to meet all of our needs, um, especially in the case of um, modalities that we at the Army care about, like, like uh, perception um, in the non-visible and things like this. Uh, not only it's it's more difficult to, to for industry to get that data, but also uh, perhaps they don't they're, they're not as interested as we are in, in those kinds of models. So so there'll always be a need. We are I argue um, to to build our own custom models, and, and we'll talk more about that too. This is one example of work that we're doing at ARL at the Army Research Lab. Um, so so by the way, the Army Research Lab is the uh, Army's premier lab. We 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 are tasked with with doing fundamental research as well as transition work. Um, and so this is part of, uh, of, one of our collaboration with academia, in this case with MIT, led by uh, Antonio Turaba. And in this case, what we did was stitch together various uh, uh, large pre-trained models coming from different places into a single unified latent space and integrated that with a 3D representation of the world. Now, this 3D representation of the world can be obtained on the fly through SLAM or whatever. Um, but the, the point is now we're able to do all sorts of interesting queries about the world. Okay, so, so say, look at this image and we can uh, play the sound of a door opening and the robot will understand that it's referring or, or an, a, a, an item in, in this uh, scene is that specific door there uh, that you can go through. You can show a picture from the web of, of any chair and, and the robot is able to uh, leverage uh, that information to uh, uh, say that the chairs in this specific or the sofas in this specific uh, uh, scene would serve a similar function. All of this leveraging, uh, because we're able to leverage these general models that are uh, um, providing information uh, across modalities and we, we're able to query them in a unified way. Let me give you some examples. So, so this is a, a case where we query uh, the robot. The only thing we pr provide to the robot is this natural language query, something that goes well with a Ronald McDonald outfit. So Ronald McDonald is the uh, McDonald's uh, uh, chain uh, mascot. Uh, the robot processes this query and goes ahead and finds the, the big red shoes. Okay, so uh, that's one example. But this this one may be a bit more interesting. Um, let's say we show a picture without any information about who is in the picture. We just show the picture and we ask something this guy would play with. And, and, and in the picture, by the way, we have Michael Jordan, who is a famous basketball player. So the robot is able to process this information multimodally and goes ahead and finds the basketball. Okay, so we're starting to see this kind of open-ended uh, reasoning, um, and this introduces a, a whole new set of possibilities. All right, so I'm moving on to a different topic. Um, this is about small models at the edge. So the general idea is that these models are very powerful, but really at the edge, um, and often we, we are facing contested environments. Um, so we, we may not have access to the internet, and even if we did, we can't just send uh, sensitive information uh, through the web um, and certainly not use uh, public uh, uh, or, or, or APIs that we don't control, such as OpenAI's uh, API, for instance. So what we need is the ability to, to take these big models, compress them, um, distill the relevant information for this, the specific subset of tasks we want these robots to do, and deploy the, models, uh, the model at the edge. So, so this idea of small, large models at the edge. Okay, um, so the key idea there is uh, symbolic distillation. That's uh, shown by um, Professor Yi Jing Choi's uh, work from UW. Um, she's, she's also one of our collaborators now, um, just started in July. And here's one, one, good, one good example of what we're talking about. Um, in this case, she started with GPT-3, which, which has 175 billion parameters. That's, that's pretty big. Um, would be very hard to deploy that at the edge, uh, in a robot at least. Um, and, and she was able to retrieve relevant knowledge from this, this, this model automatically. So, so even this knowledge is retrieved automatically using GPT-3. Um, and then 
she's able, she was able to train a student model that was 400 times smaller, optimized for common sense causal reasoning. Okay, so um, using a fully and a fully automated pipeline, she's able to generate uh, or almost fully automated pipeline. She's able to generate a much smaller model that is optimized for common sense causal reasoning. Now you may think. Okay, uh, so we're sacrificing uh, size and generality. Um, you know, we're probably sacrificing the performance um, in, in, in the test, but you know, at least we were able to deploy this at the edge. In fact, in this case, she was able to show that the, the student model was performing better than the original model. So really, in this particular case, we got the best of both worlds. It shows the idea that we're able to um, retrieve relevant information for our specific use cases from these models, um, create smaller versions of it, and now we're closer to being able to deploy them at the edge. Data starvation, continual learning, and synthetic data. So um, this is a, another topic. Um, here, the idea is that high quality data leads to high quality um, output. So in the case of visual uh, uh, Gen AI models, um, for instance, text to image uh, models, um, we know that the bigger the model, uh, the better the performance. Okay, so, so the lower, the better here. Um, and if we trace which training samples contributed the most to specific outputs. In this case, the text prompt was something like a fictitious uh, creature in a forest environment or something like that. Um, and it's, it's an interesting output, but when you trace it back to, to uh, the actual training samples, um, so you see that the samples that are contributing the most are relatively close. So again, this idea that high quality data leads to high quality output. The issue is that we're, we're starting to reach uh, the limits of existing data. Um, some would argue we, we kind of already did for text data and we're getting closer in terms of image um, data and pretty soon video data. Robotic data is, is further behind because we do need uh, physics information and I'll talk a bit more about that. But there's, there's this uh, notion that we're, we're starting to uh, reach the limits of existing data for, for training purposes. So how, how do we go from there? Um, one, one solution is synthetic data. Okay, um, so this idea of, the, of using synthetic data to um, continually improve uh, the model, um, and that's exemplified by work uh, from Professor Alexei Efros at Berkeley. This is one case where um, he's using a stable diffusion model to edit imagery. So the idea is that you provide as input this image of a, a girl on a horse, and you provide a, a prompt that says, have her ride a dragon, and, and, and the model is able to convert the horse to a dragon without changing uh, the rest. Now, how did he do this? Uh, he started with a, a off-the-shelf stable, stable diffusion model and then created pure text and imagery synthetic data to fine tune the original model. Uh, and the way he did this was, uh, the way his team did this was to uh, use GPT-3 to create variations of certain uh, prompts. So for instance, photograph of a girl riding a horse uh, and, and GPT-3 provides alternatives like have a ride a dragon and so forth. And then use these synthetic prompts to create synthetic imagery using another stable diffusion model. Okay, and then he used the synthetic data to fine tune the model. And what he found out was that the final model was not only good in the models that he, in, in the cases he was specifically trained for, but also beyond those those um, uh, fine tuned uh, data samples. So the final model was better than the original model and much more general than even the, the, the synthetic data that was used to train it. To train it. So that's one example where, sort of out of nothing, pure synthetic data, um, we were able to do um, to build a better uh, model. Now, if, if, if the AI system is actually uh, able to interact with the world in a systematic manner, um, if so it is embodied in some way, we, we can also bring to the table this idea of, of self-learning. So that's what we see with, with uh, babies, for instance. They, when they play with things, it's, it's, it's sort of directed. It's not random. Um, they're, they're really uh, trying to understand um, implicitly uh, the causal effects and, and uh, the properties of the world and so forth. So this kind of directness can also uh, be used, this idea to, to do self-learning. So without having a teacher saying, this is how physics work or whatever, just, just by playing with it and, and uh, learning the redundancies between, between the uh, multimodal input, you're able to learn about the world. So we can also bring that, that idea to, to our robotic systems uh, or embodied systems. Continue to learn about, about the world. Okay, um, so those were some of the uh, topics more related to um, you know, big challenges um, and opportunities. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about the risk mitigation side of things. Um, so 
the, the, the first area I'll talk, uh, touch on is, is trying to understand how uh, the um, models generate what they do. Uh, this is a very challenging explainability problem because, because these models are unlike previous systems that are specialized on single tasks. In this case, these models are specialized on, uh, we wouldn't even know how many tasks. So, so the challenge is, is that much better. But the point I wanted to, to, to bring here is that we can also use these big models, these large machine models to help us the autonomous interpretation. So, so here we get into that idea of autonomous agents, leveraging the reasoning capabilities you were starting to see in these models. So the literature, uh, the literature is, is increasingly providing evidence for some very interesting reasoning capabilities that, in, that are emerging in these models, such as the ability to use tools, the ability to, to do verification of intermediate uh, steps um, and, and, and so forth. And these are the kinds of uh, capabilities, high level capabilities we see in humans, okay? So what, what we're trying to do here is leverage these reasoning capabilities to build uh, autonomous agents, uh, in this case, for autonomous interpretation. So again, this is a, a work with, with MIT. Um, and uh, what we did here was build an autonomous interpreter with a GPT-4V backbone. Um, we can plug in any, any uh, multimodal model there. Um, and what we also did was give this agent the ability to access external tools. So these are working functional pieces of code that are external to the LPTM. We just teach the LPTM um, how to use it. What is the input? What is the kind of output? Um, and, and that's it. And so, so the, the, the agent basically has a GPT-4 or a LPTM backbone and then the ability to use external tools. And then we ask for a black box visual network. So a visual network that we don't know what it does. What does unit X in this unknown network do? Okay. Um, and what we see is, is, you know, it was it was certainly very interesting the first time I saw it. I I was very impressed. Um, the model is able to autonomously start producing very reasonable initial hypothesis. It it uses the tools that it was given access to to get some samples, explicitly test those hypotheses. So here it's, it, it requested these samples and it's testing uh, how responsive the neuron is to, to these hypotheses, keeps refining those hypotheses uh, and even makes some type of causal reasoning. So towards the latest stages of, of its, its reasoning, and note, there's no human intervention here. This is, this is just the system going. Um, it, it gets to a point where it, it wants to test explicit hypotheses about uh, color responsiveness. And so what it does is it gets a, 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 a sample from, from the existing data set of a car, changes that sample to have bright green colors, and then tests the responsiveness of the, responsiveness of the neuron to the new sample. And you see the difference. The, the neuron is much more responsive to bright green colors. And so it concludes this neuron is highly selective for the bright fluorescent green color in various contexts, which Honestly, it's, it's, it's kind of impressive. Uh, now, of course, the idea is not to uh, entirely replace humans, at least in the near future, but, but to use this kind of automated tools to help human analysts and test and evaluation uh, experts to start optimizing that pipeline. Um, we're also working uh, to uh, expand this line of work to um, interpret large protein models, starting with small models. Um, and, and there, the idea is not to just in, in, interpret single neurons, but, but groups of neurons kind of like understanding what human brain does, um, uh, at least in the sense of using similar methods. In fact, one of the persons in, in, in our team is a neuroscientist. Uh, yep. Um, and, and now we're doing this for these artificial net, uh, networks. This is kind of interesting to me. Okay, so this one, this slide is a bit more, um, I guess, a nuance, but, but important. Um, this is from, you know, uh, building on, on Josh Tenenbaum's um, arguments. Uh, and here the idea, the fundamental idea is that, or the fundamental question is, how far can you go in terms of beating world models with a language alone? Is language sufficient to provide a full understanding of the world? Um, and, and his answer is very clear. It's, it's unlikely. Um, in, in fact, we're starting to see a little bit of the limits of that. You know, the, the, these companies, OpenAI and so forth, are, are scaling up these models more and more. Uh, and we're starting to see a, a, a reduction in, in the uh, improvement of performance. We, we haven't reached that limit, so we should still, it's still worth keep going. But, but clearly, it, just increasing the scale is not enough. 
and the reason is that that transformer based architectures are, are really not uh, inherently built to learn world models uh, it, it's interesting that they're learning um, that some some properties of world modeling are emerging but, but they're not inherently uh, designed to, to build world models. So, so uh, he's arguing that we, we do need to complement uh, the, the uh, LPTM with um, uh, external uh, um, components that, that capture some of these other properties of human cognition, uh, in particular, probabilistic reasoning. Um, so, so, you know, then, then he, you know, he shows uh, re research on, on how to do that, on how to leverage LPTMs to uh, train these other components uh, of, of, you know, the artificial uh, brain, let's, let's put it in those, in those terms, um, and, and how, how we may get there. Um, but the main point that I wanted to emphasize here is, um, yeah, we, we are unlikely, I, I do agree with that, we are unlikely to, to be able to, be, to build a full world model just by using language, um, at least let's try multimodal, um, but, but likely we will need to, to take inspiration from uh, human cognition or other biological systems to, to improve these, these systems to, to, to be more general uh, um, and, and, you know, able to do this kind of probabilistic, thing, probabilistic thinking that we see humans do. All right, the other very important topic, um, and this one is, has certainly been getting a lot of attention from DOD, uh, uh, you know, think CDO, CDO's uh, Task Force Lima, for instance, how do we evaluate these models? Now, uh, academia tends to focus or has focused uh, a lot on general holistic benchmarks for, for these models. Um, so, so, for instance, Percy Liang has a very nice um, framework called HELM uh, that tries to do that. He evaluates uh, various uh, models on a, 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 a very, um, you know, a comprehensive set of general properties, you know, um, how fair, how biased, how toxic, and so forth. Um, and, he, you know, basically they can keep uh, um, running these tests over any any model that comes out. Okay, so this is interesting to uh, to have general uh, sort of use case agnostic um, uh, benchmarks. But we we at the DoD certainly need to have more focused uh, benchmarks um, that that are mission specific, use case specific. Um, I, I can I can expect that once we start talking to to leadership, it's it's much less important to provide these general uh, characteristics of a model uh, as it is to provide a specific performance uh, attributes or characteristics for, for, the, for, for that mission. Um, so, so we do need that. Um, so CDEO was talking a lot about a, a maturity model that fits nicely with that idea as well, I think. Um, and so, so um, that's what, we'll, what, what this area is about. Uh, one thing I would note is that setting the right benchmark can be a goalpost. And, and this has been done before in science. Um, when we set a good goal, goalpost, what happens is that the community starts working towards uh, getting there um, and that, that can contribute to, to ideation and, and the, the development of the area. So there's also this idea of, of setting a good benchmark to, to get the uh, DoD research community to, to be more focused. Of course, we need uh, benchmarks that are multimodal, not, not just about text um, performance. Um, so, you know, um, not only performance on visual tasks, but think longer term interaction. You know, these models are increasingly able to um, do longer term interaction. And in that case, how do you perform how do you evaluate the performance of, of, of these systems? They also started to become increasingly autonomous, you know, those reasoning capabilities I mentioned. So in those cases, how do you evaluate the performance of the model? Okay, let's talk about um, AI safety and alignment. Um, so there's this uh, statement that came out uh, a while ago uh, that talks about risks of extinction related to this uh, um, technology. Um, so it's it's, it's a single sentence, there's no detail, but yet it got hundreds of signatures. Um, so, I, you know, uh, this, is, this is one set of um, concerns to have, perhaps more for looking. Uh, at the more mundane level, we, we certainly don't want bad, bad, bad actors to do bad things with this technology. This is the case of a dark web uh, LPTM where basically there's no guardrails. You know, these, these folks are creating a model and you can do whatever you want with it. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad, no controls. So that's problematic. Uh, this perhaps is more forward looking. Um, so we went ahead and talked and, and invited Joshua Bengio um, to, to come and talk to us. Um, and he, he gave a great talk and it was a great conversation. It was interesting to see that they, he was certainly, seemed very open to engage with us uh, and discuss this, this issue. And he mentioned a few important topics. Um, so the first one, 
um, is this idea of AI misalignment, which refers to the notion that there is a mismatch between AI behavior and, and human intention. Uh, now, this is uh, an important topic in, in, in this case because these models are so general, it's, it's sort of hard to understand what they can do, first of all. But there's also an issue of, can, can we control it uh, uh, well? Because uh, the way we control these systems is very different. We're just providing, uh, you know, you know, natural language input or something like that. Um, and so therefore, it's, it's, a, it's a, an unusual way of, of controlling these systems. Um, how can we prevent bad actors from using these capabilities to do bad things? Um, and perhaps more forward looking, how do, we, how do we prevent loss of control of AI, for example, example, due to unexpected self uh, preservation uh, emergent uh, goals? We need research on countering superhuman AI. So, this idea of AI to defense, defend against AI. Um, so, if, if there's going to be superhuman AI on the adversary side, um, we need superhuman AI on the defense side. Um, now, defense is usually harder than attacking. Um, we need, uh, so yeah, I guess, you know, to, 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 to be effective here, we need uh, cooperation with allies, multiple persp perspectives uh, to, to lead to efficient uh, ideation and so forth. Um, but, but the main thing is, is really um, having programs that, 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 do, that do this, you know, superhuman AI to, to, to defend against, um, you know, bad actors. Um, he notes that, that uh, you know, this, this technology is, re is really powerful. We, we, we need to ensure that this is um, um, under democratic governance. We, we want to avoid single points of failure, and we want to avoid single individuals, corporations, um, and, and gov governments from accruing too much power. Um, and, and this was kind of interesting. He does, he does note that the ideal ecosystem for, for this work is, not, is neither what we often see in industry, neither what we often see in government. It's some, something in between. So something that is able to move faster than, than government, but, but certainly not driven by economic interest. So um, this idea of uh, sort of the best of both worlds. Okay. Um, all right, so we have a lot of work to do, uh, as, you, as you saw, and, and that was really just a, you know, a, a sort of a critical subset of, of, of the topics, and there's more. But how do we do it? Uh, so let's talk a little bit about compute. Um, this is, this is a, a very important uh, aspect to executing this roadmap. We know that large language models improve uh, as, a power, as a power law of, of um, model size, uh, training data, and amount of compute. Um, so like I said, we haven't really reached uh, those limits yet, but we have evidence that, you know, that the bigger the, the, the scale, um, the bigger the performance, uh, and we, we haven't really reached that limit. Um, and if you look at the history of progress here, we see that a lot of the recent models um, ha require a lot of compute. So most architecture advances uh, occurred under 10,000 petaflops, um, such as transformers. Um, so this is the kind of thing that is accessible to academia and perhaps to um, service labs th these days. But um, those, those, those critical those critical emerging capabilities, those, those interesting, powerful capabilities do not occur at lower levels of scale. If we don't have the ability to train our models at larger scale, we're basically um, limited to waiting or working through industry to, to get there. Now, some might may be fine with that, but let's talk about it. So by the way, this, this uh, threshold, uh, this yellow area, you know, it's, it's something like uh, 10, 10 billion petaflops. Um, that's roughly 600 H100 GPUs running for, for a week or something like that. Um, and you see also here, it's, it's, I've improved this picture since, but in this slide deck, uh, it's here in gray. Disclosure required at, 10, at 100 billion petaflop under the White House executive order. So this is an interesting uh, threshold. Um, if you're doing work above that threshold, you have to report it which kind of shows that there's, there's this concern about doing things at a certain level of compute. Um, but let's talk about why, why should DOD be uh, in the yellow zone? There's, there's many reasons, um, you know. Um, like I noted before, uh, industry is unlikely to do all the things that we care about. Uh, we should have DOD that is uh, keeping track of any critical technology for uh, our interests. Um, and I would certainly argue that this is one of those cases. 
um, in, in the, 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 the closer we are to this technology, the, the faster we're able to apply it to our critical use cases. Um, and there's also an, an issue of having some, some independence from, from commercial interest um, and, and uh, also the idea that um, academia or industry may just not be uh, as motivated to explore certain use cases as, as we are, um, or in fact, as it may be our responsibility. So there's many reasons why I argue we should be able to do research at, at this, you know, in this critical yellow zone. How do we get there? So um, this is a, a proposal for a multi-tiered computing infrastructure for um, AI research and development, uh, different levels at the team level, that would be the lower level. Uh, we want, um, you know, teams or, 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 or yeah, um, um, to be able to do experimentation. That's, that's you know, um, maybe maybe 30 H100 GPUs or something like that. Uh, then you go bigger, um, maybe at the institution level, that, that's perhaps a, 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 um, um, a service lab or a university or something like that. Um, you want, you know, maybe a few hundreds. Uh, it's actually a thousands. This was an, an original uh, set of numbers. Uh, I, think, I think hundreds is, is probably uh, more adequate. Uh, then you can go bigger, national compute hubs here. We're talking about um, cross-institution uh, collaboration, large, larger scale projects. Uh, this is perhaps where we're exploring the most pro promising advances uh, discovered at the lower stages, and we're scaling it up to see what emerges. Uh, and of course, we, we, we don't have to be limited to, to what we shouldn't be limited to what we are seeing today, even in industry. Um, there's this notion of trying to understand how far can this go? I mean, we're starting to see things we have never seen machines do, um, and it's important to understand how far this can be uh, done, this can go. Um, so now we're talking about investments in, in projects that we, we've seen humanity do in the past, um, you know, in the order of billions of dollars of investment, you know, think the Adrian Collider and so forth, the Hubble telescope, this kind of thing. Uh, but this would be a frontiers level where we can bring the best uh, in the world, at least allies and, and US, and we work on really big uh, projects. Um, in practice, we probably start at the low levels. We, we show the relevance of this technology for specific use cases, and we start motivating the need for the, the higher levels. Uh, if you think these numbers are exaggerated, you know, um, for those who haven't seen, um, Meta is, is planning to have, by the end of this year, um, over 300,000 H100 GPUs um, um, and over 600,000 H100 equivalent uh, GPUs. Um, this is the kind of numbers uh, we've seen in industry. Um, yeah, uh, we, we're not there. Let's just put it that way. Uh, by the way, this is also consistent with the uh, NAIR proposal that is out there to have a national compute hub, but this is complementary because this would be focused on US strategic interests, um, the, 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 the DOD research roadmap. So it's complementary to, to whatever is uh, being made available to the rest of society. Okay, conclusions. Um, so LPTMs, Gen AI, uh, introduces a powerful new paradigm for, for AI um, with, with uh, lots of implications for, you know, let's say simpler, uh, use cases um, such as text summarization to, to more complex use cases. Uh, that's, that's things like open-ended world reasoning. Um, now, now here, by the way, I, I just wanted to say one, th one thing about simpler. Um, so simpler doesn't mean it's, it's any less important. You know, uh, if you're talking about starting with, you know, enhancing DoD productivity, you know, just by summarizing relevant do doctrine or, um, you know, generating reports or, you know, summarizing emails, all of it, that's important. That's likely to lead to you know, uh, a lot, uh, lots of increase in productivity, billions of dollars uh, of, of savings and so forth. But the point is, the roadmap should not be limited to, to those uh, use cases. We, we need to start thinking about longer term interaction, uh, more autonomy uh, in these systems. Uh, and that's, and that's uh, these uh, high risk, um, high impact use cases. Um, I certainly argue that we, we should be leading uh, collaborative research in these uh, in this, in this critical technology, um, perhaps at the very least, have, DoD should have technical parity with academia and industry, uh, if, if not be leading. Um, but, um, but we need to build an ecosystem for that. Um, and, and of course, uh, I'll argue service, service labs like, like the Army Research Lab should be playing a central role um, in, in that ecosystem. We need research that focuses not only on opportunities, but also risk mitigation. That, that should go hand in hand from the start. Um, and then we need to work closely with our transition partners to, to understand how this 
technology actually reflects in, in critical use cases, uh, such as command and control, whatever. Uh, and we need a major investment in computer infrastructure to support this, this ecosystem. Um, if, if we believe this, this technology is, is critical, uh, we need to, to, to create the means to, to, to develop this research roadmap. And I'll stop here, and I certainly welcome um, any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, that was great. Very interesting work that you're that you're uh, that you're currently working on. Uh, we do have some questions in the chat as well as in the Q and A. Uh, so I'll step through those now. Um, the first question we have is from Paul. He says, "Do we have or are we developing methods that can determine if information processes are the same in different trained models, perhaps such as a design structure model and a reservoir computing model?" Uh, if we if we have um, sorry, could, could you repeat the first part of that? Sure. He says, "Do we have or are we developing methods that can determine if information processes are the same in different trained models, perhaps such as a design structure model and a reservoir computing model?" Right. Um, so, on, on the one hand, that brings up the issue of being able to interpret how systems, how these systems are producing their output. So, so we, we did, I did discuss that, that line of work that, that tries to understand how that outcome comes to be. Um, the other thing I'll note is, it's surprising or unsurprisingly, even when you talk to, to the folks that actually design these systems, you know, uh, we, we've had meetings with Google and so forth, it, or, 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 or high profile academics, it's, it's not uncommon for them to also be surprised about what these systems are producing. So basically they, they don't fully understand how it's working. Um, but this also, a lot, also relates to the issue of, of misaligning. Um, so there's some methods that, that help us understand how, that help us to control the process by which the, the, the system is producing output. Um, that, that's, 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 that's ongoing work uh, to make sure that, you know, the way, the way um, a system works for specific use cases, you know, um, has some sort of guardrails and so forth. So that can be done. Um, so that's, that requires uh, fine tuning or creating variations on the architecture. That can be done, um, but I would also say that there's a lot of common ground across uh, use cases. You know, for instance, these reasoning capabilities, um, whatever the, the use cases may be, uh, including these two, that there's likely to be common ground um, um, in the way the system needs to operate, and then there needs to be an aspect of, of the task that is more specialized to the specific tasks. So, yeah, it's 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 sort of a high-level answer, but I hope that helps. Thank you. Our next question for Merrick, what is your position on quote unquote creativity versus quote unquote hallucinations? So far, LLTMs are failing to pass the thrush threshold goal oriented system behavior validation due to high cost of failure. Right, um, so certainly for DOD uh, um, use cases, um, we need to be able to have mechanisms to control hallucination or, or Ground the answers on actual references. So if you're providing text output or recommendation, we need systems much more than perhaps uh, in commercial applications that refer to authoritative uh, sources um, as to why that was produced. Um, so that that is uh, essential. But I would also know, yes, the creativity piece. I mean, you can't expect a system to do novel things. Say, say you want to do course of action generation. I mean, uh, for for command and control. Yeah, you, you provide all this relevant information about what's happening out there, and then you want to come up with a course of action. How can you do that without having a little bit of uh, creativity? So it's it's about uh, creating uh, ways to control the model, um, more creativity, less creativity, uh, more grounding or less, um, um, it, it, that in a way that is specific to the use cases. Um, so um, there is research in, in terms of uh, providing more grounding, controlling more hallucination, the interpretation work with MIT, by the way, is, is also trying to understand where do hallucinations come from, you know, target, and to try to understand which part of the network is contributing to the hallucinations. And there's some prior work coming from Anthropic that shows that you can modify that piece of the network to reduce the, the amount of uh, certain types of hallucination. They've done that for reducing toxicity and so forth. So you, you can target those things for specific use cases. But I also want to emphasize that um, this ability of, of having systems that are Creative. We've certainly seen that in, in the visual domain, video domain, and so forth. But but 
but, but we want to apply this to, to meaningful DoD use cases. Um, you know, course of action generation is, is, a, is an obvious one. We do need some, some level of creativity there. Hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, our next question for Marcos is the data slash source for this for the chart on the previous slide available to us. Um, and he says the publication versus training computation chart uh, on the top right on the second to last slide. Uh, so, again, I'll have a report available. Uh, this, this report is, is going to be uh, um, available early fall. Um, if you are with government, there's a white paper that I can share uh, already. But I think the best is if you're able to wait until early fall. There's going to be a full report on this with much more detail on this specific part of, of things. Um, and and, and that, that is going to be available to um, all gov government folks, hopefully, uh, at the very least, all DoD folks. Um, also, feel free to, to reach out if you have specific uh, interest in, in terms of um, helping build compute or just get more information on that or feedback on on what on our thinking about it. Just just reach out. Happy to help. Sounds good. Uh, next question from Marcos. How do we solve the problem of getting AI ML talent parallel to NAT SEC operations and out of the research labs of the department? Seems like research labs have really figured it out, but leveraging AI ML has difficulties at the warfighter level. Yeah, uh, interesting question. Uh, first of all, I would say that even the labs are having difficulty in attracting talent these days. This is a very competitive field. So this is really about having a thriving ecosystem where we're working with, um, you know, a talented a, a, a academia and, and, and the best industry out there. Um, there's many reasons why folks would still prefer to work with us. It's probably not going to be a financial reason, but I, I, you know, we certainly have honorable uh, mission. Um, so th there's many reasons why we 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 we're still able to attract talent. Um, the the connection to the um, folks on the ground, um, there's many ways to do this. The first thing is, is to raise awareness of this technology. Okay? So actually letting folks try it out. Now I'll, I'm going to point out two, two um, good examples of how that's been done. Um, Nipro GPT from the Air Force uh, and KMO GPT from uh, the Army, AI2C. Um, so these folks have developed a version of, of GPT that you can use, um, and at least Nipro GPT you can use with CUI content. You just request a, 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 an account. It's, it's easy uh, enough, um, and so you can play with it. Um, and there's feedback that, that folks using these systems are already uh, gaining meaningful improvement in productivity. Um, even, even some senior leaders, um, you know, uh, using the, these systems regularly to, you know, do, do the kind of day-to-day uh, -day, uh, tasks. So exposure to, to the technology is one thing we can do. Then um, you, we also see, uh, you know, new folks uh, joining the workforce that are interested in this. Um, so, you know, obviously training courses is, is relevant, Ex you know, uh, having the opportunity to expose them to, to the research issues. Uh, and then uh, the third thing is actual partnerships between the research labs and the centers, the, you know, the transition centers, let's put it that way. Um, so these are the, the centers that are uh, the experts in specific use cases, um, e even more than, than perhaps the researchers uh, in the service labs. Uh, but at the same time, um, they, they may not have the bandwidth or, or the ability to do the kind of research and have the, the, the deeper understanding that we do um, on the research side. So let's work together. This is what we're trying to do. We're already working with, you know, for instance, the folks that are developing Camo GPT. We're talking about uh, maybe we'll do multimodal uh, in the near future. What about agents? Um, and, and other partners. Um, so, so that's that's one way in which we can start um, not only uh, improving the uh, capability of existing folks out there, uh, but also um, um, eventually starting to to recruit more. Uh, having a thriving ecosystem should help us recruit more. And by the way, also having uh, uh, this type of compute that, that I propose, you know, that we're proposing here would would likely be a very important factor to attract. Uh, talent and folks to want to work with us. This is a big gap uh, for instance in academia. They, they just, just don't have it. So lots of things there, but I hope I hope it helps. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, next question from Ming. How you, do you define the team level slash institutional level slash national compute hubs? 
Uh, yeah, this is really about the size of the compute. Um, so, so these numbers were all, all, all sort of defined through our discussions, in particular after, after the uh, big meeting we had in November. It was kind of interesting. We brought leading academics from all over the country, and, and an emergent topic where they all converged to is we need this compute to do the work. And so after the meeting, we, we put together this white paper that sort of lays, that, lays down this, this structure. Um, and, and, you know, uh, again, pragmatically, we start with, uh, um, you know, a few dozens uh, modern GPUs. Um, H100 is just an example. Uh, this is the kind of GPU industry has been purchasing these days. Of course, we have H200 that's coming out, and, and Blackwell was announced earlier this year. Um, but, but that's sort of the, uh, the type of compute we need. Now, just getting 30 H100s is, is like over a million, uh, so it, it requires investment. But it's, it's an initial investment that is likely to show the value of, of this technology for the specific use cases at, at that, you know, for, for that specific uh, uh, lab or team. Um, and then when you think about institution level, you can you can probably purchase a bigger compute and then do uh, uh, engage in bigger projects. Now, uh, thousands of H1 GPUs is probably unrealistic. This is what the academics were hoping for. I would say probably hundreds in, uh, at a first stage. And then we go ahead and show uh, the, the, the relevance of, of these uh, models um, to, to the various use cases we care about. Um, and it won't be hard to justify bigger investments. I mean, if we think about the DoD budget, uh, you know, going even to this last level, if we believe in it, we'll be able to do it. Thank you. Uh, monitoring the chat, it seems that our next question is from uh, Rushira. Is one neural network generating hypotheses about its own neurons or the neurons of a different neural network? Right. Uh, in this case, it's about a, uh, the neurons of a different network. Uh, it's kind of interesting to do that. And we, I would not be surprised if folks have done that already. Um, I'm, I believe even OpenAI has done, well, OpenAI has done GPT-4 on GPT-2 or whatever, or, or 2.5 or whatever. I wouldn't be surprised if they're doing the same model for the analysis as, as the uh, uh, you know uh, object of study. That's an interesting question. Um, we'll get there. I think the, the, the practical issue is that we still don't have great methods to study these these um, big models uh, yet. It's it's very complex, um, but we're getting there. So you know this 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 example shows studying a single neuron, but really. Uh, you know, even if you think about human brain, you, you're not trying to understand what a single neuron does. You have to understand what groups of neurons do. I mean, so that's the level of analysis we're, we're trying to bring to to uh, to this space. Our next question: Will this compute infrastructure be accessible by small businesses participating in the DoD Cyber Program? Right. That would be the idea. Um, so again. Um, I don't see any other way of doing an effective ecosystem without having industry and academia in it. Um, and of course, the defense uh, industry would be a, a key role, um, would play a key role in this ecosystem. We had lots of defense industry folks uh, at our meeting. Right. We had a couple of questions, and I think it, it was answered in the chat, but just for completeness, could the Army's version name be put in the chat. Is it independent of Nipper GPT? Uh, a couple of people wanted to verify the name of the Army GPT. Yeah, um, so I don't have access to the chat right now, but it's Camo GPT, C A M O GPT, and AI 2 C is behind it. Okay. Is, is leading the effort. Okay, sounds good. Um, our next question from Colin. The problem with artificial neurons is inability to mimic the XOR function in logic, not equivalent to, quote unquote. How do you overcome this in spiking neurons? Uh, that is a very, um, yeah, detailed question. Um, I'm not going to be able to give you a, a, a detailed answer, but I, I will say this. Um, so right now, obviously, we're writing this wave. Um, that is built on the transform architecture, you know, very interesting properties, but obviously we're not limited to it. We, we, we're not limited to it. Um, there's also this argument that we're studying this 
these gene engineering models, but they're, they're not really how the human, they're not, they don't work the same, the same way as the human brain does. This is an alien brain, but it's a powerful alien brain. So we're not necessarily limited to the ways, we're not limited to the way nature works, um, but we're just go, gonna go ahead and study this thing in its own right. Having said that, of course, we should be uh, trying out different ideas and trying to improve, you know, the, the transform architecture and all that. So that is just part of the roadmap. Uh, the, the interesting thing is we have already seen, it's already been shown that we can do things that we never really perhaps thought it was possible. So, so, so much, uh, that, that more reason to, to go ahead and try new ideas, um, building on this existing uh, uh, body of work. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions we have from Colin, does your framework approach have any hooks in place for any hooks or place for theorem provers, also known as proof assistant products? Look, I, I, I think that's very important. Yeah, um, this is, this is a, a, a template for many use cases. I don't think the point is for these LP, LPTMs to have all the human knowledge, but it's, it's, it's meant to have this, this general uh, ability to um, do do general reasoning and so forth. It's like it's like starting with a human and then training specializing this human to whatever job you want. And that is that is that can be done by fine tuning the model on one on the one hand, but also giving access to these external tools. So whatever the domain is, yeah, theorem provers. If it's if you're looking for you know performance in mathematical problems or whatever, uh, in in other in many other key tools, I mean, I, I don't think there's a point in, in, in trying to insist that these models are, are able to do, you know, all, all the kind of math. We just go ahead and, and give it access to, to meaningful tools that do that. There's no point in teaching a human to, to do all of the, uh, uh, you know, sophisticated math that we're able to do these days. You just, just use a tool for that. So that's the same idea here. And in, in a way that connects this line of uh, research on LPTMs with all of the other existing lines of work. Thank you. Uh, next question from Jim. How can the US maintain advantage versus adversaries such as China when some of the latest models are open source? Uh, right. Um, well, the, the thing here is, as, and, and I'm, I don't, not referring to anything that is not available publicly. I mean, the Chinese are just already very good at this technology, uh, you know, in this space. So there is um, nothing to prevent them from building these models already. Now, it's a good thing that the, the it's U.S. companies that are mostly leading, uh, as, you know, um, and, and, and Meta, for instance, is certainly committed to doing everything in an open manner. Um, my point is that in practice, it's 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 not a limitation that necessarily that that you know Meta is is opening up. Um, in fact, it, it it it's useful for a lot of researchers even on our side, um, because we don't have to train to train these models ourselves, and we do have access to the weights and we can do things. I think it's more about uh, understanding that. Um, well, on the one hand, there's a series of custom models that are not going to be open ever if we do this right. Um, there's data that is not going to be shared ever. That, that's a unique advantage of the, 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 the DOD. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that will give us the critical advantage over, over the adversary. And the other thing is, is really our innovative spirit. You know, you know this, is, this is the American way. We, 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 we just go forth and, and innovate. We just keep doing it fast. Um, I really like the Olympics, by the way. In the last day, the US got Got the most medals, and just just you know those wins, last last second, split second wins. That's that's the American way. Thank you very much. Uh, we're right at one o'clock. Uh, monitoring the chat, I don't see anything else in the Q and A. Um, so I'd like to thank our presenter today for a great presentation. Um, I think we can see by the activity of of the chat and the Q and A um, that this is very relevant research and very interesting. Um, I put the link to the CSI webinar page announcement in the chat. Um, so if you go back there, you'll be able to download the slides um, and please check back to that same uh, website. Um, we will be posting a recording of this presentation as well. Um, please give us your feedback on the survey 
on your way out. Um, if you have any suggestions for future topics you would like to see, or if you have other questions, um, please submit it to me. I'll get you in contact directly with the president, with the presenter, or CSI can do some research for you. Um, please take advantage of our free technical inquiry service. Um, but with that said, I'll let everyone go. Um, and hopefully we'll see you next month for our next presentation. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you for the great questions.